His name means embracer, and it's actually pronounced Habakkuk. Very, very interesting name. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. My name is Rod Hembry. And I'm Jess. And this is Bible Discovery as we learn from the Bible exactly what God is saying to us, because the 66 books written by the 40 authors are God's Word. That's what we believe here on this program. Well, as we go forward, Corey and Ryan are here. Corey? Okay, so I'm going to be taking a look at the prophet Habakkuk and also the book named after him. Ryan? Well, today I'm going to look at a possible connection between Isaiah 63 and Habakkuk chapter 3. All right, there's a very interesting day because we are working with the subject of the prophets and all of that. And then, of course, we're getting ready in a few weeks to move into the New Testament. So that's really interesting. So, Janice, what did you do? Today, rejoice in the Lord. All right, so take your Bible guide out and turn to the page which we study today. If you don't have a Bible guide, stay there. We'll tell you how you can get one. Let's open up the most important book of all and listen to God. Habakkuk 2, 1 through 11. I will stand my watch and set myself on the rampart and watch to see what he will say to me and what I will answer when I am corrected. Then the Lord answered me and said, Write the vision and make it plain on tablets, that he may run who reads it. For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it will speak and it will not lie. Though it tarries, wait for it. Because it will surely come, it will not tarry. Behold the proud, his soul is not upright in him, but the just shall live by his faith. Indeed, because he transgresses by wine, he is a proud man, and he does not stay at home. Because he enlarges his desire as hell, and he is like death and cannot be satisfied, he gathers to himself all nations and heaps up for himself all the peoples. Will not all these take up a proverb against him and a taunting riddle against him and say, Woe to him who increases what is not his, how long? And to him who loads himself with many pledges. Will not your creditors rise up suddenly? Will they not awaken who oppress you? And you will become their booty. Because you have plundered many nations, all the remnant of the people shall plunder you because of men's blood and the violence of the land and the city and of all who dwell in it. Woe to him who covets evil gain for his house, that he may set his nest on high, that he may be delivered from the power of disaster. You give shameful counsel to your house, cutting off many peoples and sin against your soul. For the stone will cry out from the wall, and the beam from the timbers will answer it. Habakkuk chapter 2, verses 1 through 11. We continue to study through the prophets. It's uh, really interesting as we look at some of the names of these ancient prophets. As we focus today on the book of Habakkuk. That's right, Habakkuk. H-A-B-A-K-K-U-K. It's a very interesting name. Now, Habakkuk is a name thought to derive from the Hebrew word that means the embracer or one who embraces. Like Jeremiah, Habakkuk lived during the time when Judah would fall to the advancing kingdom of Babylon in the east. Now, the Babylonians were ruthless in their warfare. We know, however, that their treatment of Jeremiah, the prophet, was oddly civil and good. Apparently, word had gotten to them that Jeremiah had been encouraging the people of Jerusalem to peacefully surrender to Babylon's power. Well, in his book, Habakkuk begins by questioning God. as Someone alive or anyone alive in Judah would do at that time. He would say, O Lord, how long shall I cry and you not hear? Even cry out to you, violence! and you will not save. Habakkuk 1 verse 2. He questions the motives of God because 
He doesn't fully understand the punishment of God. The Lord's punishment never comes to those who do not deserve it. God is perfect, but he always punishes sin because God is holy and sin is opposite holiness. Our world here today is full of sin. And because of that, Jesus Christ came to make a way for us to avoid the punishment of God. So often you'll hear me say on this program, you need to come to know the Lord. You need to pay attention to what he's doing. Not because I'm trying to get you to do anything, but I'm trying to help you understand as I've understood that I am a sinner saved by the grace and faith of Jesus Christ, that we are all sinners. And when we come to Jesus Christ and we say, Lord, forgive me for my sin and help me, Lord, from this moment on to make you as Lord of my life, and to put your Holy Spirit in me to build my life differently than I might be building it. So that's very, very important. So I encourage you to do that today. It's very, very critical. And by the way, there's other people on the television and on programs that you see who say, come to Christ. And, and I agree with them. Uh, you know, Franklin Graham is one of them. He does a great job. Uh, and, and, you know, we, we have to pay attention to these people because they're telling us the truth. Now, with that in mind, let's take our Bible guide and turn to Habakkuk. Now, if you don't have Habakkuk or you don't have a Bible guide, you can write to us or call us and we will send you a Bible guide. It's very, very important that you understand that. Uh, the Bible guide helps you understand the scripture. And we're going to take several verses here and highlight three points from it. And so that's really, really important. Now let's pray today and ask the Lord to help us. Father, I pray as we enter your word that you would help us to hear it. Help us, Lord, in the name of Jesus Christ to understand the words of the Holy Spirit as he speaks through the great prophet Habakkuk, the embracer. As he's questioning you, help us to hear what's going on and help us to pay attention that we might know how to handle the life that we live in today's world. In the name of Jesus Christ, we said together, amen. Now, look, look at the first passage of scripture here. It says, I will stand my watch and set myself on the rampart and watch to see what he will say to me and what I will answer when I am corrected. Then the Lord answered me, and the Lord said to me, Write the vision and make it plain on tablets, that he may run who reads it. For the vision is yet for an appointed time, and but at the end of it will speak, and it will not lie. Though it tarries, wait for it, because it will surely come, and it will not tarry. Which brings me to the first point. God answers Habakkuk, the vision is happening for the history and for the record. We often do not understand God's timing because it is so far beyond our time. The Lord speaks to all of time and all of space. So many times we, we tend to judge what God does in our hearts and in our lives in a very interesting way. We judge it based on what happened now, what happened now, what happened two days ago, what but let's understand that God is looking at our whole life beginning to end. God is not only looking at our life, but the lives of many others. And he's looking at the beginning of time to the end of time. God sees everything. So we must be patient and understand what God is saying. That's very important. Now then we go on. This next one is very interesting. Here is what the Bible says as we open up verse four. It says, see, behold, the proud, his soul is not upright in him. But the just shall live by faith. The just shall live by faith. God says that the just shall live by faith. By their faith, we must remember to live by our faith in God, not by our circumstances. I want to do that all the time. I want to live by my circumstance. Well, Lord, you know, this is not going right. That's not going right. You got to help me. That's not... But I need to adjust the way I pray and say, Lord, this has happened and this has happened. 
I'm hurt by it, but you know, I understand that you can get me through this. And it's like when he told Jeremiah, I will make your forehead stronger than the horses of your enemies. God is creating in us a life. He's creating in us a person for eternity because our eternal life begins when we come to know the Lord. And so beloved, we need to pay attention to that. Now let's go on to verse five. He says, indeed, he says, listen carefully, indeed, because he transgresses by wine, he is a proud man and he does not stay at home because he enlarges his desire as hell and he is like, a, like death and cannot be satisfied. He gathers to himself all the nations and heaps up for himself all the peoples. Will not all of these take up a proverb against him and a taunting riddle against him and say, woe to him who increases what is not his? How long? And to him who loads himself with many pledges, will not your creditors rise up suddenly? Will they not awaken who oppresses you and you will become their booty? Because you have plundered many nations, all the remnant of the people shall plunder you because of men's blood and violence and the land and the city and all who dwell in it. Woe to him who covets evil again for his house that he may set his nest on high, that he may be delivered from the power of disaster. You give shameful counsel to your house, cutting off many peoples and sin against your soul. For the stone will cry out from the wall and the beam from the timbers will answer it. Now listen carefully to the last point. God tells Habakkuk, there are consequences for how we live right now. We should not live for dishonest gain or demand our wants, but we must thank God for his provision. God has made provision for us, beloved. We must remember and say, thank you, Lord, for your provision for helping me. Regardless of what my wants are, my needs are met. In Jesus' wonderful name. So as you read through the biblical book of Habakkuk with us, I'm sure you'll see right away that not a whole ton is known about the prophet Habakkuk because he doesn't offer a lot of information about himself. Uh, some of the other prophets give us a little bit more to go on, but we're, we're not stranded without hope when it comes to examining him and his book. So let's do that right now. The Old Testament book of Habakkuk records the visions of Habakkuk the prophet. Habakkuk himself did not record the time of his prophecies or which king was reigning in Judah when he prophesied. But thankfully, it's not too difficult to discern based on historical analysis. Historians and theologians put Habakkuk into one of two reigns, either that of Josiah or early in the reign of Jehoiakim. This is based on Habakkuk's prophecy of an imminent Babylonian invasion that began in 605 BC and continued for years, ending in the eventual destruction of the temple in 586 BC. Based on Habakkuk's description of the evil practices going on in Judah and Jerusalem, dating him to late in the reign of King Josiah or early in the reign of King Jehoiakim seems most probable. This would make Habakkuk a contemporary of the prophets Zephaniah and Jeremiah and perhaps Ezekiel and Daniel. The book of Habakkuk is unique in structure and content. The first two chapters record Habakkuk's complaints against God and then God's replies to him. Habakkuk's complaints no doubt echo the heart cries of many. First, why do you allow evil, violence, and injustice to go unchecked among your covenant people? And in response to God's answer that he was bringing the Babylonians to execute judgment, Habakkuk then asks, how God could use people guilty of greater evil to bring judgment on a people who were less evil. The third chapter of Habakkuk records a psalm or hymn of praise written by Habakkuk, likely for use in the temple. 
Along with the three chapters of Habakkuk, there are also extra biblical traditions about him. In the apocryphal chapters of Daniel, called Bell and the Dragon, Daniel is thrown into the lion's den for a second and longer time. But this time, an angel goes to Judah and finds Habakkuk cooking a meal for his servants. The angel transports him and the meal to Daniel in the den. Habakkuk presents the meal and is transported back home. These extra chapters of Daniel are not included in the Hebrew Bible or in Protestant Christian Bibles, but are included by Roman Catholic and Orthodox Bible translations. A portion of the book of Habakkuk was also found among the Dead Sea Scrolls. Dating to the mid-first century BC, it's a commentary on Habakkuk that includes Habakkuk chapters 1 and 2 with a line-by-line -line commentary. Habakkuk chapter 3 is not included, likely because it was seen as its own work as a psalm, apart from the visionary work of chapters 1 and 2. This Habakkuk scroll has revealed the way that the Essene community understood and used the scripture. For them, Habakkuk was an ancient code given by God that only their leader was given the cipher for. Only their teacher of righteousness could expound the true meaning of biblical prophecy. For them, Habakkuk was directly applicable to their own time. So there we go, a quick look at Habakkuk and his book. On tomorrow's program, we're gonna be taking a look at Zephaniah. How would you like a name like Habakkuk or Habakkuk that means embracer? So if you call somebody's name, embracer, come here, you know, what, be, what do you have to do? You have to hug the people I because mean, you're the <laughs> embracer. So that's very, very interesting. Thank you, Corey. Very good. All right, Ryan, you're up. All right. Well, today I'm going to be looking at a possible connection between Habakkuk 3 and Isaiah 63. And it seems that these two chapters are describing the same scene when Christ will return to judge the earth. And Habakkuk, seeing the future, says, beginning in chapter 3, verse 3, that God came from Teman to judge the nations. And you know, Teman is a place within Edom, and Edom, of course, was founded by Jacob's brother Esau. But now, if we flip back to Isaiah chapter 63, Isaiah is also describing the second coming of Jesus Christ. And starting in the very first verse, he also sees the Messiah coming from Edom to judge the nations. So it seems that both Habakkuk and Isaiah are describing Jesus Christ's second coming. And this context is very important for what I'm going to talk about today, because in Isaiah 63, 7 to 10, a mysterious figure shows up, a figure referred to by Isaiah as the angel of his presence, that is, the angel of Yahweh's presence. But the question is, who is this figure? Well, keep in mind that the context of Isaiah 63, as I said, is the return of Jesus Christ, which Habakkuk also seems to confirm. Let's study. Hi guys, I'm Ryan Henry, and today I want to talk about the Trinity of God because a lot of people claim that there's no biblical evidence for it. Now, in reality, there are several passages in both the Old and New Testament that support God's triune nature. And we're just going to look at one of those today, but a very significant one. So grab your Bible and let's go. Okay, so the Trinity. Well, all three members of the Godhead, namely God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, show up at different times and in different places throughout Scripture. In Isaiah 63, they seem to appear all together. Beginning in verse 7, Isaiah says, I will mention the loving kindness of the Lord and the praises of the Lord according to all that the Lord has bestowed on us, and the great goodness toward the house of Israel, which he has bestowed on them according to his mercies according to the multitude of his loving kindnesses. For he said, Surely they are my people, children who will not lie. So he became their savior. In all their affliction he was afflicted, and the angel of his presence saved them. In his love and in his pity he redeemed them, and he bore them and carried them all the days of old. But they rebelled and grieved his Holy Spirit. So he turned himself against them as an enemy, and he fought against them. Now, in these verses, there are three distinct manifestations of God. Verse 7 mentions the Lord, capital L-O-R-D, indicating that this is Yahweh, or God the Father. And verse 10 mentions God's Holy Spirit. But in between these verses, we read about another manifestation, the angel of his presence. That is, the angel of Yahweh's presence. Now, while some Bible scholars equate this angel with the Holy Spirit, others see this as a clear reference to God the Son, because it is a very unique title. 
As George W. Knight explains, although angels are mentioned often throughout the Bible, this is the only place where the phrase angel of his presence occurs. This is probably a reference to Jesus Christ in his pre-earthly existence. There is no doubt that Jesus existed with God in his pre-incarnate state long before he was born into the world. So he certainly could have served as God's agent of redemption with his people in the days before his earthly ministry. He goes on to say, this name of Jesus may explain the references to the mysterious angel of the Lord in the Old Testament. This special agent was sent by God to communicate his message and to assure selected individuals of his presence. This messenger was clearly not the typical angel, but neither was he God the Father. The best explanation is that this special messenger, the angel of his presence, was none other than Jesus Christ. Now, this view is actually further supported by the larger context of Isaiah 63, which is about the coming of the one who comes from Edom with blood-stained garments, aka the Messiah. Therefore, Isaiah refers to all three persons of the Godhead in this single passage. So based on the context of this chapter and other scriptural references like Habakkuk 3, it looks like the angel of Yahweh's presence is none other than God the Son, Jesus Christ. Which means that in this single Isaiah passage, we have all three members of the Godhead. God the Father in verse 7, God the Holy Spirit in verse 10, and right in the middle in verse 9, the angel of his presence, aka God the Son, Jesus Christ. Now, this is very significant because a lot of people claim that there's no evidence for the Trinity of God in the Old Testament, in the Old Testament, and this is just one example that proves otherwise. A lot of people say that that's because the word Trinity is not in the Bible. But just because the word Trinity is not in the Bible, remember the word Bible is not in the mm -hmm. Bible. So that doesn't necessarily mean anything. But uh, this is fascinating because there's all over the Old Testament, all over, I call it the original Testament, but all over that place, there's just mention after mention after mention of God, the Father, Son, the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. And he says, love the Lord your God with your heart, soul, and mind, three. And so we need to keep that in mind. That's very, very important. Okay, Janice. Today, uh, rejoice in the Lord. And I have a note for myself, easier to say than to live sometimes, isn't it? And I look at this fascinating prophet, Habakkuk, and um, I look forward to meeting him someday. You know, it's a very different book, isn't it? Because usually it's God calling his prophets to speak to his people. But here it's Habakkuk coming to question God on behalf of the people. And it's very different, isn't it? And I like that that Habakkuk is very direct. He comes to God with, with his questioning. He he this whole book deals with the problems of understanding God's ways. And, and we look through this, and, and Habakkuk is asking these questions, but God doesn't really give him clear answers to his questions, does he? Instead, he calls on, let's look at uh, verse 4 of chapter 2, Behold the proud, he's telling Habakkuk, his soul is not upright to him, but the just shall live by his faith. God was making a very specific point here about the difference between those who follow God and those who don't. So he's coming to God with these questions, and you see that by the time we get into chapter 3, we see the prophet's prayer here. But he declares that he would rejoice in God no matter what. We read that in chapter 3, verses 17 through 19. When we read that, we really see that Habakkuk had accepted and appropriated that message, the just shall live by faith, to his own life. Now we read in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, that faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Let me read that again. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Hebrews 11.6 goes on to say this, but without faith, it is impossible to please him, meaning God. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. And I came to rejoice in the Lord because um, Habakkuk declared that he would rejoice in God no matter what. 
And that is a lot easier to say than to do. It's really easy, isn't it, to rejoice and be happy in the Lord when things are going our way, but a little less easy when things are not going so well. But in order for us to live by faith, we can't live in our circumstances. We have to trust in the one who holds the circumstances, who holds us in his hands. That's the one that we have faith in. And that's how our faith builds. Because as we have relationship with that God and we see his steadfast faithfulness, Jeremiah saw it, remember in Lamentations 3? He realized that God's faithfulness was new every morning. And we have to live on that same faith. Philippians 4, 4 through 9 say this, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice, says Paul. Let your gentleness be known to all men, for the Lord is at hand. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, make your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will guard your hearts and mind through Christ. And then he encourages this. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue and if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. That's what we need to do. Meditate on the faithfulness of our God. Thank you for joining us today. And I wanna say, Lord, help me to refocus my life on you. Teach me your way and show me your path in the name of Jesus Christ. And Father, I do wanna pray for the folks and the people who have given to this ministry, bless them and help them to pay all their bills. It's a tough time in the world today. And I wanna thank you, Lord, for the ones who have given to keep us here. Thank you, Father, for their provision and for your work in their lives. In Jesus' name, amen.